Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael Motherfucking Kester. Yeah, I'll take that. I got nothing. And um, there's th- there's two films today on yeah. Double Feature, which today is we're the show do you've two downloaded. Films on Double Feature, we're going to cover Frozen and Mulberry Street. It's important to note that Frozen is the recent Frozen from 20, 2010. 2009, 2010. Right. I think it's 2010. Although you said 20, 2010, which made me think we were way in the future. The actual important thing to note about Frozen is that it is not a sequel, not a remake, and Michael? It's not a Japanese one. True. Uh, neither is Mulberry Street. That's right. Mulberry Street is completely original in right. all of those aspects. If you were to pick a school, where would you say these schools were from? I would say the old school. Okay. And a country? Of American genre. <laughs> Horror. Did your genre have a harsh G on the beginning there? No, genre. Yeah, it's got to be old school American horror because it's Adam Green. Mm-hmm. And uh, just by definition, that's there's not as much He created chopping. it. It's his, it's his idea. He's, yeah, right, right. Uh, plus, we decided last year that we were going to play a little bit looser with the, uh, with the title of old school American horror. Otherwise, nothing gets that title. That's right. It's pretty much Hatchet and All the Boys Love Mandy Lane, which you've never seen. You've never seen that. Is that good? Should I check that it's out? It's great, but you'll never see it. Why? They didn't release it on DVD. It just kind of like fell serious? by the wayside. Yeah. Oh, no way. That's terrible. I'm sure that's got to be out there somewhere. Someone will send us a, uh, a link. I just got an angry link from somebody in the email the other day saying, you stupid fuck, Penn and Teller Get Killed is on DVD, and they sent me an email link. Didn't we cover that it came out on DVD? Yeah, they probably haven't gotten that far. Oh, Not everybody stuck. understands that podcasts aren't live, okay. that they're actually recorded in mm. advance, and then they stay up on the internet uh, forever. Right. That's, so, that explains why we got to stop doing that thing where when people would click download, we had to go to their house and talk <laughs> right. into a can, which was right. attached to their iPod or Zune. Whatever. Do Zunes Zoon, have chapters? <sighs> Zunes still don't have chapters, to my knowledge. Email us. But um, you can go in the lyrics section, and uh, it'll tell you where we start talking about each of the movies. Timestamps. Timestamps, sure. Yeah, I like that. Timestamps, all right. And then we have chapters for other devices. Great. iOS devices. Okay. And okay. computers and whatnot. So you can just uh, skip directly to the movie we're talking about, and you may want to do that, because we're going to spoil both of these movies. Now... Uh, no, we're going to spoil both of them. 62% movies. chance spoiled every we're, time. We're definitely going to spoil both movies and spoil them fucking hard. Yep. Frozen, I mean, as soon as you talk about a single piece of the story mm-hmm. uh, beyond the DVD jacket right. stuff, then it's spoiled. And Mulberry Street, I think we probably need to talk about the ending. I think Mulberry Street, yeah, Mulberry Street is incredibly spoilable. Yeah. If you're going to watch Mulberry Street, it's about rat zombies. Yep. And that's all you need to know going in. Um, and Frozen, I don't know, stuff is cold. So what are we doing first? We're, uh, we're going to cover Mulberry Street first, the Jim Mickle film from the eight, what is it? Eight films to die for. That's what it was called. Great. So before we talk about Mulberry Street, let's talk about eight films to die for, because the concept is extremely exciting. To it me, is. Although you warned me. So yeah. give me your take on this. The thing about eight films to die for is really similar to the After Dark Horror Fest, which uh, is, is, is still going on. I don't know if the eight films to die for has actually continue continued doing that or surviving, if it just... but essentially what it is, and it's a great idea in theory. Eight films to die for continued surviving. You really thought I would let you pass that up. It's a good idea in theory in that it's basically people with a lot of money, the production company people who are eight films to die for. Not the films themselves, right. but the company. Right. Or After Dark Horror Fest pick... For example, eight films sure. to um, eight horror films that are independently made, independently put together, and they distribute them in a wide release kind of scale. And also, they put them in theaters. Oh, around so they come Halloween out theatrically. Time. They too. come out in in limited release, sure, theatrically, but in an avenue that the films would otherwise never be seen. Yeah, yeah. The downside is that, as with a lot of art most of it isn't as good as you want it to be. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a pretty broad statement to make well, about the, all art. If you, if you, it, it, let's look at it this way. If you pick 10 artists, you're not going to find 10 pieces of art. You like that's probably not saying true. all 10 pieces are bad. Not saying nine of the 10 are bad, 
but that only one will probably really appeal to you. Sure. And well, there's eight to choose from. And that's and Mulberry Street is the one for me. Well, I haven't seen the other seven in this set, but yeah, I have to say I'm right there with you. Before we start talking about, I guess, tone, right? Because tone is something I really want to... If Mulberry Street gets nothing else right, tone is definitely the thing to pull from it. Mm -hmm. But the man creating the tone is Jim Mickle, who I'd never heard of before. Me neither. And uh, turns out to be kind of fucking awesome. Yep. So run down the list of things that he's doing in this movie. Uh, Well, Jim Mickle in Mulberry Street, he directs. Uh He writes along with uh, Nick DiMici, who plays Clutch. Clutch. Yeah. He also edited the yeah, film. Yeah, great. He's the sound editor. <laughs> Perfect. And he's responsible for visual effects. And then Beth Mickle, whoever that was. A relative the, or somebody with a coincidental name. Yeah, the uh, production designer. Right. Um, that's amazing. That's great. So I say whoever that was, and we don't know, uh, which normally I would be ashamed of that we're not better prepared for this. But actually, something about this excites me. So neither of us, I mean, I can speak for myself, but I got the impression you didn't know about uh, Jim Mickle before the end of this. Nope. We both kind of saw in the credits like, hey, Jim Mickle, oh, look, also did that and that and that and that and that. So this is really exciting to me because most of the the directors I enjoy who do everything, Mm -hmm. I know that they do everything. And so I feel it's kind of self-enforcing. Right. I feel like I might enjoy their stuff more just because I know that. You know, I go and I see those movies and I think this is one person's vision and, you know, I'm going to get behind that just because it's the kind of thing I like. I had no idea about that with this yeah. film. And I started thinking the same things I usually think when I know that ahead of time. I start thinking it's incredibly fluid. All the pieces meld together really well. It just feels like one, you know, to call it coherent. I mean, it's almost eye rolling because, yeah. yeah, it's one person who does it. It's really coherent. But you know what I mean? You see this, yeah. and it's just so synchronized. It's so together. I think I think the strongest way for that to happen, I think, is the uh, the usual strength trifecta in putting together your own film mm-hmm. is directing, writing, and editing. Yeah. I think if those three things are all something that one person is behind, right. you really get the story from the beginning to the end put together exactly the way it was intended to. Sure. And and that's good because it'll especially if you're looking at it from a writing standpoint, the editing won't cut out story elements. Mm-hmm. It'll definitely focus on the right parts of each scene. Yeah. Because just because people are talking doesn't mean that's what the scene's about. Right. Just because people are dying doesn't mean that's what the scene's about. A character can walk into a room and what's really important there could be a shot of what's in the door as they come in. Yeah. And somebody who isn't, you know, editing that themselves isn't directing that themselves that might get lost somewhere certainly along the way but when you have when somebody's doing it's basically from start to finish somebody Mm -hmm. is working on the film before it's born while it's being made and then on the cutting room floor quite literally yeah the more i start doing it myself it seems like editing is one of the most underappreciated um, pieces. I mean, there's also a million jobs in the end credits of any given film that I still have no idea what they are. So to call editing the most underappreciated is is probably just flat out incorrect. But it's, so much can happen. So much can change in editing. And even if a director gets a final pass and can make notes on re-edits and, and things of that nature, that's really where you set the tempo for things. That's really where you decide how fast your story moves what characters you get to know, what a scene, like you said, what a scene really means, you know, once everything is said and done. And like I said earlier, the tone is what Mulberry Street is about for me. It's this, um, it's relatively chill, you mm-hmm. know, for a horror movie. Right. We, we, kept, we were liking it to Million Dollar Hotel, which we did earlier this sure, year. Sure, sure. You know what it felt like to me? It was kind of a combination of do the right thing and REC. Have you seen do the right thing? No, it's, um, it's one of the classic Spike Lee movies. Okay. One of the ones he was you know, okay. really well known sure, for sure, before sure. it was kind of a name. And it's just kind of about this heat wave that happens in this really close knit, uh, neighborhood. And here we're dealing, you know, and the REC comparison is, is really direct to our million dollar hotel, which we actually did yeah. in a double feature together. But you know, it was about those apartment buildings, mm-hmm. about the, that complex of people and how they knew each other and how, you know, whatever event affected them. And that's very much what Mulberry Street is about. It's Although kind I of think a combination there's... of those two films. It's kind of REC and Million Dollar Hotel jammed sure. together, 
but it's not the elements that you would necessarily right, right. expect from either film. Particularly in the in what we're talking about, Million Dollar Hotel is a really relaxed kind of flowy, almost like you you pointed it out. It's a very hippie yeah. kind of <laughs> right. it's Woodstock. A commune. I think the word vibe. commune was used. Yeah, and that's what that's what goes on in Mulberry Street is all the music's kind of pulled back. All the lighting is really warm. Right. Even when bad stuff is happening, things don't get tense. Things don't get erratic. It's kind yeah. of bad stuff's happening, man. Yes. <laughs> In that voice, too, depending on which character we were talking about from uh, Million Dollar Hotel. But yeah, there's this kind of stillness to it. And so, you know, when I'm watching it, I'm thinking to myself, oh, they're definitely setting up this stillness. So when shit hits the fan, it's going to be really bad. You know, I just feel like I know exactly where this movie's going. Sure. I know what it's trying to do yeah. now. Well done, movie. And even when stuff starts getting really bad, there's still this kind of surreal calm to it. And part of that could be in production values mm -hmm. because it is a very independent film. Yes. It's, you know, it's very noticeable seeing it. Sure. I mean, we, we see stuff on the show all the way from, you know, fucking no budget. Uh -huh. to james cameron steven spielberg yeah right you know the the stuff like aliens mm -hmm. right or, or any you know, of the spielberg stuff jurassic park i mean you know we've seen uh the bigger budget stuff in here and so often it's hard when you watch that whole range of movies to really peg in what is an independent film because half the stuff we do was probably qualifies as independent on some level right whether it was made independently and bought by a bigger studio or, you know, whether the studio just didn't give them any money for the kind of project they were doing. Um, Mulberry Street, I think, is like a fifty or $60,000 uh, kind of venture. And it really doesn't even look it. It looks far more independent. Yeah. Especially when you think about something like Mariachi being yeah. a $7,000 picture. A comparison to a budget like that is, of course, unfair because Mariachi is known for that. But when I think independent and low budget, that's, you know, that's my sure. go-to. Sure, well, that's the go-to. And so everybody has to work harder for that film to be successful. You have to rely on the things you can control without budget. Uh, but I don't feel like the stuff that... So, uh, for instance, when we actually see kind of the monsters mm -hmm. or um, the scenes with aggression, that stuff feels like it's well done. Mm -hmm. I don't get a feeling that anything in the movie is up. That's where the budget could have been right. a little stronger. Yeah. The two things people usually uh, splurge on, you know, camera and sound... I mean, the stuff that's going to give your movie those higher values, those seem to be pretty squandered. Yeah. I mean, you know, we start out with a, a pretty low budget look and a pretty low budget sound, but I think that gives the movie, you know, a lot of its charm. Yeah. It knows that that's going to work to its advantage mm -hmm. for the type of, you know, sure. feeling it's trying to give. Um, for a feeling that's a, a lot more relaxed, right. that is a lot more chill. And a lot of the character base are kind of in the same world as, you know, a less expensive film. They're living in a, their apartment buildings about yeah. to go derelict and sure. be bought out, knocked down. Everybody's poor. The apartment building is falling apart. I mean, right, if right. you look at the clientele in the building, it's what? A cross-dresser, a down-and-out boxer with a, with a war vet for a daughter. Mm -hmm. And two elderly war veterans. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, that's, I mean, there are, I'm sure there are other people that we see running around, but those are the people we focus on. We focus on kind of the, not to, not to sound like a, like a preacher here, but like the downtrodden characters of, you know, no, I understand what you're saying of the, of the area. It's, it's people that are kind of poor. They're not well to do. They've got small apartments, right? They can't take a shower. Without if they had any more wrong. money than they did, they wouldn't live here. Exactly. But the characters are put together in such an interesting way. I was telling you about this, and we kind of both came to this realization, that in a lot of films like this, a lot of zombie films, we're using that word sparingly because this is, it's, it's kind of... Well, I don't watch zombie films yeah, anymore. Yeah, me neither. So. In a lot of zombie films, it's all that about... That sounded really pompous, by, by the way. I don't watch zombie films. Um, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of zombie films, there's huge masses of people. The ones with the biggest guns go down first... So that you see that there's a formidable opponent. Yeah. And then it's just not, it's not a matter of who's dying. It's a matter of how graphically they die. Sure. In this film, so much time is spent marrying you to the characters, showing you, you know, they're working hard, they're individuals, they're human beings. Yeah. They've all kind of 
coalesced in this building. They all know each other. It's 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 kind of like I mean, I live in an apartment building. You live in an apartment sure. building. You get this vibe of the people around you. You may not know them really well, but you coexist. You see them. You know what they're like. You feel that kind of even if you don't feel like you're really part of a community, that's always amped up, you right. know, in the films. Right. But especially when you live in a in a complex like that where right. half the people's doors are hanging off mm-hmm. the hinges, you get to know your neighbors. Sure. And there's just like this strong unity between the characters mm-hmm. that really makes every death really difficult to handle. Yeah, it yeah. makes everyone count. It's not, okay, that guy died. Wasn't that graphic? Oh, now this guy's going to get their arms sure, ripped off. Sure. It, I mean, the, the deaths aren't that graphic. Right. They're not super, you know, badass fist pump satisfying. Which is so smart because having graphic deaths, it doesn't fit within the constraints of the film. Right. You know, when you think about what do you have to make this film? One thing you don't have is, you know, giant elaborate deaths and makeup. And if you start pumping a lot of money into that, you lose it in other places. Right. You work with the stuff you have and that makes your film look really strong. It makes it feel really strong. And I feel like that would shortchange the characters. Yeah. It would shortchange a lot of the nuance that goes into the film. Right. You know, other things like the the lighting, I really like the warm yellow, kind of like sure. New York summertime lighting. Right. The music is really good, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, the lighting is, um, you get the shots really early on when we're looking at the rats of the bright green kind of stuff, the really colorized stuff. But when we're hanging out in the in the apartment complex itself... I mean, it kind of, I have a great set of Portishead live videos it reminds me of. Kind of desaturated, and it's uh, it's these bleak kind of brown colors, but the music gives it almost this sense of optimism. It's kind of this lazy, reverb-heavy, kind of grunge sound yeah. almost. It's um, it's distorted. It's stripped down, I guess is what it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a really odd combination of of kind of down toony trip hop that kind of sways right, in and out that's of the out of it almost like, felt like Portis had that's probably of, what yeah, I was thinking about it that. sways in and out of maybe almost easy listening yeah kind of thing but it's it's constantly being battered by a combination of like 90s grunge and yeah. early 2k's new metal right just right. knocking on the door of these laid back digital drum tracks as if you know the the amplifiers were in the next room over right you know it gives you the feeling kind of how uh the people in each apartment can hear directly what's happening right in their neighbor's place sure. as you can in cheap shitty apartments that's how the guitars sound mm-hmm. you know they're mad and distorted but they're they're kind of over there and they're not paying too much attention to what's going on they're, they're not hurting anyone just right. kind of let them <laughs> do right. their thing we're right. over here and that adds so much to the ambience i mean it'd be a, a completely different movie without that that music you can tell that the director has some kind of experience with sound design even in you know looking past the music that could be a one-off thing they got that right but even in how the sound is mixed and this is going to get a little more subtle and maybe everyone won't know what i'm talking about but this is okay so good example go back into the movie listen to you know the the media clips that happen every time there's you know old-timey radio or some kind of news bulletin, it does something really clever that I almost feel like should just be a default. So many times when you're seeing the type of, let's say, 28 Days Later, you know, opens with a lot of those news clips folding one over the other, this kind of montage, and they're direct, you know, line in, you get the news clip almost exactly how it would sound, maybe a little bit crunched down so that it sounds like it's coming out of a TV or what have you. But here you don't have your microphone as if it's directly up against the stereo. You're hearing that room ambience. You can hear the echo bouncing off of, you know, as the the broadcast comes out of the stereo and it hits the furniture and it comes back into the camera, whether it's done organically or, or digitally, you hear that kind of warm room reverb and it sounds like such a small detail, but it's just another one of those things you don't feel like it doesn't have the impact of, you know, sounding as if you're being directly fed the news. Mm-hmm. Instead, you're sitting in the apartment with those people and that sounds coming in, you know, the same way for you as it is for them. It's such a small detail, but if you were to change something like that, you really would as as an audience, you're not aware of it, but you would notice it. Well, sure, nothing beats you over the head with this film. 
not even something something that I think is really notable and also very fucking ballsy. Mm-hmm. The characters' relationships, you never find out how anyone knows anyone. Yeah. Particularly the the three leads, Coco, Clutch, and Casey. Mm-hmm. It's kind of made pretty clear that Casey is Clutch's daughter. Right. But there's some weird dynamic between Clutch and Coco that seems like maybe they were friends and then Coco decided to be a cross-dresser and right. now Clutch is uncomfortable with it. Yeah. But he's still, like, deep down, that's still his best buddy. Yeah. Because they refer to Casey as our girl. Sure. You know, that kind of thing. And it's it's really ballsy to not show your characters' roots with each other and to just thrust the camera in as it would if you were being thrown into a group of people that you had never met before. Right. You know, we you just see to... how they react and you kind of have to piece together their past mm-hmm. based on what they're doing, what they're not doing, what they're saying, that kind of thing. I remember you and I used to have that conversation a lot, you know, working on other stuff. I think we've probably had it on the show a few times, but just coming into a scene naturally without getting pretense you know, sometimes in movies you have to deliver a certain amount of exposition to kind of set up who your characters are, and maybe it's a little bit unnatural. We made fun of that along with Black Dynamite. I'm 18-year-old Black Dynamite, and you're my 15-year-old yeah, kid brother. Right. So rather than play that game and say, how gentle can we deliver this information, it says, you know what, that doesn't really contribute to the emergency that's happening here. So we're going to let you kind of just try and pick up those details as they would fall naturally. Mm-hmm. And not hand them to you. Once again, giving you the feeling you're kind of in this rainy apartment complex yourself. And I want to come back to the characters because I am just fucking in love with Casey. I think that is such a phenomenal character. And it's one of those characters that reminds me we don't do enough interesting, strong female roles Uh on this show. I really miss, uh, you know, we did that episode on A Scanner Darkly. Right. And it was all character stuff. And once in a while, a film comes along and you can really dive deep into into character stuff. And I think this is definitely one of those films for sure, but they don't give you a whole lot to chew on. You don't, you have the details in front of you. You're really involved with the characters, but you don't have a lot of information to kind of, to pull apart. Another thing to contrast this from REC, because we're dealing with something that would double feature very naturally if it wasn't so redundant, but REC was all about the panic of the building itself, mm-hmm. almost the same way Million Dollar Hotel was. The occupants were sure. stuck in the apartment. Here, the apartment, at least for the majority of the film, is the safe place. It's outside the apartment where the trouble happens. Right. You know, your apartment still feels like home. You still want to go to it just the same way the characters live in it. And they do a really, really good job of setting that up as your home base. And so that when... There is this invasion into the apartment, which doesn't really happen until towards the very end of the film. And even then, not a whole lot. You feel this kind of violation. You know, this is your home grounds that they're now coming into. In the same way, the the one guy was talking about, he's lived in the apartment 50 years. He's not fucking leaving. That's almost how you feel as an audience. This is the apartment we've been in the whole goddamn movie. We don't want to leave that apartment. Right? How dare they come to us? So Casey's interesting to me from, you know, her opening scenes. She has this scar on her face, um, you know, probably something from the war that's obviously still really bothering her. The movie doesn't go out of its way to say a lot about the war or war in general. That just informs a bit of who her character is. That gives Mm -hmm. her, you know, that kind of baggage. Sure. And she's obviously really self-conscious about it. You know, she's constantly pulling her hair in front of it. The majority of the movie is kind of this journey back home for her. And you get to this piece at the end of the movie. And, you know, one of the things that just baffles me a ton is how there are people who, you know, who hate this movie so much. It's a really endearing film. And, I mean, it's possible that it's zombie rats, right? Or rat zombies, zombies. I guess I should say. And if you hear that sentence and you go, you know, oh, rat zombies, that sounds dubious then it's probably not the right film for you. I mean, if that's the kind of thing that could give you a hang-up. I would argue that there is so much to the film, aside from rat zombies, that even some people who might initially go, e rat zombies, I'm not sure. You know, this is I feel like you, had I told you rat zombie movie, you Mm -hmm. would not have been into it. In, In theory. Yeah, yeah. But then having watched the film, 
you know, you're on board. Yeah, no, I guess what I meant is more that if you could get hung up on a, a specific detail like that, if this sure. movie is just about what kind of zombies are they and, you know, how do the zombies, if you're into it for the zombies and not just ready to approach it as just uh, another movie that mm-hmm. could surprise you in whatever direction right, it's right. going to go for. I think maybe that's where some of that hostility comes from. But I just feel like after getting to know these characters so much, and you were right, when one of them dies, it fucking sucks. It is hard. It is not an easy moment at all. You feel every single one of those all the way down to the end. And the end manages to surprise you a bit, too. Sure. I mean, I did not feel that it was going there, you know? Yeah, no. Especially after it kind of surprised me earlier when I went, haha, I know what this film's doing. Mm-hmm. In that brief moment where Coco comes back and, you know, has that moment with Clutch and you're kind of thinking, I'm thinking at the very least, um, are they going to pull something where he hasn't been turned or is he going to decide to walk away? Or what's, you know, after the, the moment with their uh, with the kid's mom on right, the, the right. roof as well? I'm not really sure what's happening there. And so when, when Clutch makes that decision to go off the roof, that's fucking rough. And they look down and you see the, the aftermath of that fall and it's rough. And then poor fucking Casey, you know, it takes me a minute. I see that dart happen. And I'm not even I'm not even really sure what's right. going on until the movie ends and you go, fuck, that was yeah. it for her. Yeah, that's a that's a really strong testament to kind of how the film goes. She gets darted and it shows the dart. And even then you go, well, but yeah, right. But right. What's in what's yeah. in there? <laughs> yeah. And then and then she she falls and the robe kind of covers right clutch and Coco and then fade to credits. And yeah. that's when well, you the re- breathing, you get the right. breathing with that too, where you slowly see the breathing stop and, happening. And that's when you realize they're all dead. Yeah. That's but it. Only then. Yeah. Not even seeing her die. Do you realize they're all dead? Right. And it sucks and it hurts really bad. However, there are other films with just downer moment after downer moment. Fuck man. <laughs> this show's not getting any easier today. So now we're going to talk about Adam Green's new joint frozen. Yeah, well, sort of new at this point. I had to double check and make sure it was on DVD. It's one of those movies that came out. This often happens with Adam Green. He releases a movie and there's a big to-do and it's going to be in theaters and then it somehow kind of doesn't come to theaters or maybe not one close to you and you don't really know what's going on with the DVD. So I'm missing all of these Adam Green movies all over the place. But Adam Green was um, the gentleman who created Hatchet, of course, along with uh, Joel David Moore. And then Spiral... And it's really fair to say created Spiral with because that Joel David Moore directed that. He unless did. I'm mistaken. Yeah, he did direct that. And goddamn Spiral was great. And as was Hatchet. So Frozen comes out another new piece of intellectual property, something you don't get very often in horror. Um, that's uh, that's lightening up a little bit these days. Yeah, but uh, still still a problem. Old school American horror not appearing as often as it should. Now we played another unfair game of Spot the Hotter. <laughs> That's true. We it, it should have been a clue because it was an Adam Green film. It should but, have, but it wasn't at all. So we played this is this is a sad day for my co host Eric Ingram uh, here. This is this marks the first time since really you had a great Spot the Hotter streak. I know, I was doing pretty good. Um Spot the Hotter is a uh, a little game we play where Kane Hodder is in a film and because Kane Hodder usually has a Jason mask on, I uh, I try and figure out which uh which actor is Kane sure. Hodder. Now, Kane Hodder doesn't really change from movie to movie. He's no. still Kane Hodder. And he looks exactly the same in yeah, every movie. Just for some reason, I am an asshole and can't remember what Kane Hodder looks like. I think it like. was the hat this time. Yeah. Could in the be. film, Kane Hodder plays a character that the credits told me is named Cody. And uh, he's the guy who's driving the snowplow tractor. Oh, you mean the character who isn't the other three characters in the right, movie? Right, exactly. Oh, excellent. Um, and he has a hat on. And I think God that's what threw you in this this round of spot the hotter. You know, honestly, what it was is the tension of the film. That and can be. That would, that's probably far more likely. I want that. I want that to be a joke, but it's not. I cared so little about. It could have been Robert fucking England driving the the. the I don't even know. I was going to say a tractor, but that's probably not what it was. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing it was a snowplow. It's the Shining Mobile. I was so involved at that point. I don't think I even looked at him once. Um, but we should kind of work our way up to there. So the premise of Frozen is uh, that these kids are on a ski lift. It's mm-hmm. very much like Hatchet. Yeah. It's a group of kids. They're on vacation. They're escaping from school. They're going, you know, they're going off to have a couple days to themselves. Mm-hmm. 
and they get trapped off on this. Uh, I guess it's a ski lift. It's, I don't know anything. They about get trapped. They get trapped on a ski lift at a ski resort, and they get right. trapped on a Sunday night. The ski resort is closed all week. Will reopen Friday. That fucking sucks. Leaving them five days to either wait it out and hopefully survive, mm-hmm. freeze to death, or come up with a third plan. Right. And so this is uh, one of these brand of films that you know I love so very much, where you are trapped in a single place. And I think this gets even more specific than trapped in a single place, but there, uh, there is a, a surely a horror element to it, and you are waiting for someone to find you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's even more specific. There's really nothing you can do yourself. You are just waiting for someone to come rescue you, and you kind of have to wait it out. That's what makes this different than, you know, we saw Stuck on the show or even buried, which I haven't seen yet, but I assume is about Ryan Reynolds trying to get out of yeah. a coffin. Let's sure. pretend that's what that's okay. about because I sure. I don't have any other comparisons uh, off the top of my right. head. So now we're waiting it out, and I think this is an incredible exercise for writing. It's an exercise one that anyone can participate in, and two that if you're really good at, as Adam Green is, it really really shows. I mean, all you really have to do here is um, it's sort of along the lines of open water. Have you seen open Mm -hmm. water? Yeah. And so the idea is there's, again, another one that's, there we go. There's a similar reference. Um, Two people are, I guess, trapped. I was going to say trapped in open water. You can't really go anywhere. They're left behind in open water. They are waiting for, I don't even know what the term open water means. I'm now using it as if it's really describing what, they're like in the ocean or something. Okay. That's what I was getting at. (laughs) Right. And uh, sharks are going to try and eat them. There's fish touching their legs. Right. It's very uncomfortable. Essentially, the dynamic here is they need to be rescued because right. there is too much... A present threat. Exactly. They will <laughs> too, either... Too many threats. They, they, the options are be rescued or die. Mm-hmm. There, and it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting scenario because there is no third option, which is save yourself. And that's what differentiates it from uh, from other movies that are about escape from the place or about resolving a conflict in that place. It's kind of this feeling of powerlessness, which they touch on in the film. Yeah, even they talk bringing about back that. open water, they talk about the shark. Yeah, well, Jaws, I think, is specifically what right. they talk about there. And but Dan yeah. talks about the worst death being the shark circling you, seeing the fin, knowing that that creature is going to eat you alive. Sure, which is a direct and obvious and terrible parallel to his fate. <laughs> Well, but I think the movie, you know, it knows that that's completely obvious. It wants you to think about that. I think this is one of the first movies. The other movies, I've seen so many of these. They all pretend that this is a completely unique gimmick no one's ever thought of. Hey, I know. These characters will be stuck in this panic room slash phone booth slash elevator slash elevator. And how will they get out? What will they do? Oh, they better just have conversations and I'll write those. And instead, Adam Green goes, yeah, no, we're, we're aware of what we're doing over here. We're not, we're not lying to ourselves. In fact, try this at home. And that's what I think is so great is that all you have to do, the formula is so beautiful in its simplicity. You stick a bunch of characters in a place. They're waiting for help or trying to get out. And all you really have to write is that scenario and maybe an ending. You can work up to the ending. And then you yourself just fill in the pieces. If I were stuck, right? Uh, the same way they play sure. all these different games in right. waiting, you know, what three celebrities would you uh-huh. fuck or whatever else they're talking about. So, hey, guys, if we were all stuck on this ski slope here, how would we try and get down? Right. And what repercussions might that have? Exactly. Essentially, what it is, is you pick how many people you have. Mm-hmm. In this case, you pick three. And then you treat that like, that's how many lives I have. Right. Gotta waste the first <laughs> sure. two. Sure. And you, you go through different ways you would escape. Then you pick which of those, in this case, three ways is most likely for you to survive. Yep. Then you take the other two and kill off two characters. <laughs> right. Boldly kill off two characters. And this is what I talk about when I'm saying that this isn't lazy at all. This is uh, really showing off skill. Because while anyone can do this, doing it to the level that Adam Green has done it, that's where you show your creativity in picking those different options. You can start small and build your way up. Maybe I would try to, you know, create a rope out of clothing. Maybe I would try and call for help. Those are kind of boring options. Human chain. But yeah, as you exhaust your boring options, you have to start taking greater risks. Maybe I would jump down. Maybe I would try and, you know, cross the razor wire, right? And so that's when your creativity comes in, when he can then surprise the audience that he has invited to play the same game that he's playing. Right. 
he says, well, maybe you try and jump down and, oh, you know, the, the fall might kill you. If the fall doesn't kill you, maybe wolves will fucking eat you alive. Right. And so the fall itself is pretty brutal. And this is where he's flexing a little bit of the, the hatchet kind of muscles. And I see that fall and that's where I'm still going. I'm playing the game right alongside him. I can do this. I can have a character fall. And you know what? I'm seeing the Adam Green brutality that I sure. at home cannot create. Right. That he's doing far better than me. And it's, um, you know, even for myself, I think it's a pretty squeamish moment. Uh-huh. We've been watching a lot of these movies. Yeah. But man, that fall, you fucking feel that. And there's other moments too. You know, the frostbite. The frostbite isn't too bad. Uh, until the other character starts talking about don't rub your face off. Right. And then you think, wow, that would be not good. You want to make sure you don't do that. And so he falls, and this is the beginning of exchanging these moments of relief, you know, consistently pairing them with desperation. And that's another edge that Adam Green puts on this. It's not just relief and he loses and relief and another one loses and the third one gets away. Because that's all we're talking about right. here. But he falls and then... You have this moment where you go, well, he busted his legs. That sucks. He's on the ground, but he's on the ground. And while the pain of that sucks, you're thinking in your mind, ah, that sucks. That sucks. Get away. That sucks. But get away. But crawl. Crawl down the mountain, you know? Mm -hmm. And every time one of them gets down, you know, the other guy gets down the ladder. And you're like, yeah, the the wolves just get that. That part sucks. Get rid of them. But you're down there. You're down there, man. You made it. And when, when she comes down too. You're just thinking, I don't care what fell on your leg or what. This is the sure. triumphant moment. Man Every, up and walk is what right. I'm thinking the whole Every time. Every single one of those moments feels triumphant. And you know, I mean, once again, not taking the audience for granted. He knows the audience knows you still have an hour left. Sure. You still have a half hour left. You sure. still have 10 minutes left. And of course, things aren't going to get resolved here. But you still feel that tiny moment of triumph just long enough for them to take that away from you. Well, the whole time you're sitting in this lift chair and you can feel while you're watching the film this notion of just wanting to be on the ground. Yep. Just feeling like you're Those suspended. Those snow boots are looking fucking heavy. Over something that, and you just want to be down. And every time a character hits the ground, no matter how fucking hurt they are, yeah. you feel them hit the ground. Right. And you go, snow, yeah. land, trees, yep. traction. Yep wolves it's <laughs> it's the moment where you get off of the boat you've been stranded on you're on land feels good having land under your feet and the island is inhabited by cannibals right and so the wolves come right and it's one wolf at first and the wolf leaves and then it returns and in greater numbers there are many more many many more of them and the character instantly accepts his own death that he's going to die but what i love about that is you have lynch crawling this is his first attempt to cross sure, the razor sure. wire and he looks down and then he just turns around and goes back you don't really know why you in my head i remember watching it the first time going up oh, it hurts too much yeah he can't pull it off he probably cut his hands so he comes back and then he sits down just looks at her and says don't look down oh god and immediately dan starts screaming don't let her watch yep and the sounds of angry, hungry doggies oh, kind of no. overwhelm. And you have two characters holding each other's heads, staring into each other's eyes while their friend gets ripped to pieces. And the film, for the first time in Adam Green's fucking career, as far as I'm concerned, he won't show you either. Yeah, and that's an interesting move he makes. It's a really interesting move. Uh, because you don't see the corpse, right? Right. I mean, that's the thing. You hear the sounds and the tearing. You get a little bit of the tearing, just enough where it sucks a lot. And you're thinking, hey, that's pretty, that's pretty awful. And you're waiting, too. Mm-hmm. You're waiting for him to, uh, to show that corpse. And he doesn't. And that's one of the interesting moves he makes in addition to, uh, to that constant you know, relief versus tension versus you know, that give and take that keeps happening. The other one that I thought was interesting that kind of has a a double reason before we'll get all the way back around to the ending and the wolves. Um, the ski lift stops. It stops the day before it stops permanently. Right. Mm -hmm. So they get trapped up there for a few minutes. And I think that serves a couple different purposes. So of course it's to fake out the audience. And when I was watching it, I thought, wow, that's kind of a cheap move for Adam green. You know, I respect him a lot more than, Hey, this is a movie about a ski lift stopping. Oh, here's the time it stops. Nope, just kidding. That happens tomorrow. But 
The other thing that does is push back the amount of time it takes for them to get scared the second time it happens. Because if I go up on a ski lift and it stops, I'm terrified the way they were on the first day. Sure. That happens on the second day, and nobody's really worried because it happened the day before. The, the initial reaction is, oh, not again. Yeah, right, right. And, and, and the thing that you think about, and I remember watching it this time and realizing that you're exactly right because the ski lift stops, and I'm thinking this time through, well, if it were me and it stopped, I would start screaming right away, like, hey, don't forget I'm up here. Yeah, right. But they don't do that because... Th- it, it stopped yesterday, before. you know, yeah. it will eventually start again. It started up yesterday. It took, yeah, about this. Oh, the lights are off. Yeah. The lights turn off. <laughs> the lights turn off and make that great bass sound. Right. That lights. But by the time the off. lights go off, it's too late. You can't scream for help anymore. Everybody right. lights are the last thing that go. I worked at a nightclub. <laughs> lights are the last thing that go if they ever go. And so what those lights say is that, yes, they have forgotten about you. You know, you're up there. You're thinking, how long should we wait before we get worried at least as long as yesterday, and then the lights go out, while still maintaining the initial audience fake-out that you have now validated. Now you have a reason. You still accomplished a a stupid fake-out moment in the beginning, but you got away with it because now there's an even better reason that that was there in addition to the obvious reason. So to get back to that point you mentioned about the wolves, Adam doesn't show it. Seems odd for what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is so that he has that climax moment at the very end. Right. Where the music feels good, the score feels like we're getting out, and then the score just slides organically right down into that terror feeling, that fucking horror score. And then you see the carnage. You see that the second individual who came down, all hope was lost for him as well, as you might have suspected because the wolves follow him and he didn't know how to snowboard. Another awesome part of the script, didn't know how to snowboard. And so the wolves caught up with him, I assume, and tore his insides out. And the thing that's really strong about this is that Dan, who's the first jumper, he's the only jumper. Right. You don't really get a chance to know him. He's the character that you just have to like because he's a fun, loving, happy, good looking kid. Sure. But then the remainder of the film, you get to know Lynch. Yeah. You really learn a lot about him. You learn about his background. You bond with him. Why he doesn't have a girlfriend, mm-hmm. about how he's going to, you know, propose to this other girl he met, how he's actually a human being. And it's just, it sucks to see these two people now. Mm-hmm. Instead of three kids, it's two people yeah. stuck on a chairlift. So when you see his body, that really hurts. Plus, there's the obvious, like, film production thing that people tend to do where the first guy, Dan, I don't know. I've never seen that guy before in my life. Sean Ashmore I've seen in, like, (laughs) 30 films. So Sean Ashmore dies, and I go, no, Iceman! I mean, that's, that's a technique that I'm not saying this film is devoid of using. I'm aware of it, but it doesn't make it easier. No, it doesn't make it any easier at all. Yeah, and you know in that instant that that does serve as a climax because the film, if it's going to follow any conventional formula of working for an audience, this is right about the moment where you can take that last little instant to say she might not get away. Otherwise, if she's going to get away, then there's no point to the ending. Then the ending is just total fluff. You need at least a hint of doubt before she hits the road, and then once you get to the road, you end. That's what you do. You get in the car, everything's safe, the movie's over, there's no more story left to tell, your, your mental exercise is over with. But before she gets there, she sees the torn up body. You get that feeling of, well, that's what it looked like for the first kid. Now this is what it looks like for the second kid. And if she can't get out of this situation, that's what it's going to look like for her too. And thankfully, you know, the wolves have fed and we get... What I guess is a happy ending, right? Because somebody gets away. There's also the lingering possibility that she fucking dies in the car. Yeah, right. She closes her eyes, remembers something her dead boyfriend says to her, and then it says frozen. Okay? I mean, I don't want to get all crazy theorist on this. With the, uh, with the but ending. the movie's called Frozen, and the other two guys, let me tell you, they don't freeze to death. She ends up in this van and closes... She's, she's frostbitten... She's cold. She's been through hell. She could fucking die right there. Yeah, it's certainly possible. You know what? I didn't think about that at all. I kind of enjoy that. I mean, you never know. There's no answer. I wouldn't even... If I ever met Adam Green in person, I wouldn't ask. Right, because he would also say, oh, that's an interesting idea. I've never heard that before. 
but I love it all the same that we have that freedom to not go all the way home with her and sit down and watch her drink her first cup of hot cocoa and feed and, the puppy and fucking go through the pains that uh, that Castaway did. Sure. You know that that kind yeah. of thing turns into another movie in there. And we just have our first movie. We have one movie here. She gets in the car. That's the end of the exercise. That's the end of the film. That's the end of the show. Michael, did you know about our website? It's doublefeatureshow.com. Wow, that's fascinating. What if I wanted to email this podcast? If you wanted to email the podcast, you'd go to Double Feature Show. You wouldn't go there. You would email doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I wasn't okay. actually prepared for that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to no, throw you fine. one of my so, notoriously difficult on-air questions. Beyond that, donate.doublefeatureshow.com is where you can send us some cash so we can attempt to scrape together a studio once a week from a bunch of broken, rusted out parts and record a show for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll also get to pick some movies at the end of the year, but you probably already know about that. Now, next time on the show, we're going to do kind of a sci-fi day because yeah. I just want to watch two sci-fi movies. Okay. Why don't we do the usual double feature thing and we'll go one safe, big, everybody's heard of it. And one obscure thing that you probably won't even bother to watch. All right. So I'm going to go out on a limb. Let's say Planet of the Apes and Colossus the Forbin Project. That's absolutely what we're going to do. What a wonderful guest, sir. I'm really getting really good at this podcast. Really? Are you? Yes, really. Watch more fucking film. Bye.